So, um, welcome everyone and thank you for being there. Welcome to the second session of our Renaissance Labs at the Warburg Institute. Today we are talking about the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch, who lived between 1450 and 1515 with Professor Niels Butner from the Stuttgart Academy of Art, who is the author of the book Bosch, Hieronymus Bosch, Visions and Nightmare. To discuss uh, the book and the painter with Niels, I am joined by Rembrandt Deutz, known to many of you, deputy curator of the photographic collection, an expert on hair, on the Renaissance material world, on which is running a seminar since last year, and also architect of the iconographic database of the Warburg, thanks to which thousands of images are freely available online. Now, last month, so we were observing that biographies are also one obvious form of afterlives. And uh, in the case of Bosch, I think that afterlives should be always spelled in the plural because from the late 19th century, from the time that Bosch was rediscovered, about a, a thousand books have appeared on him, inventing all sorts of lives to Bosch that he probably didn't even dream of, uh, of living himself. And so, although Bosch, let me, let me show you, hang on. Yes, sorry. Let me show you a little bit more images here. Although, yes, Jérôme Bosch work is reputed for its eccentric imagination, your book, Niels, clearly show how well he was integrated to the upper layers of the society to which he belonged. He was really a grand bourgeois whose work was collected by the most powerful official figures of his time, by bishops, by princes, by cardinals, and by kings. So what you show really is that the first step towards understanding his works begins with observing that, that, it's, that it has always been super well received by some of the most powerful and conservative patrons and collector of his time, as opposed, for instance, to, uh, to someone like Caravaggio, who started life by, by shocking his audiences. So perhaps we, we could start with a, with a very straightforward question, which implies some entanglement. That is that in pre-modern art, and that's something I've learned from the, from the staff of the photographic collection, in pre-modern art, there is no such thing as titles. They are mostly subjects. So you wrote that Bosch's wealth and status enabled him to paint what he wanted. I certainly agree that his painterly styles show that he chose his own style. But can we really be, can we really say the same of the content? Would you see him as a painter author in the same way as a surrealist painter would be an author of his work, or is it more a question of disentangling the relationship between his imagination and the culture of his audience? I really look forward to, to hearing you on this on this subject. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for this nice introduction and for a wonderful starting point, because this painting, without any question, is a wonderful starting point for a discussion about Bosch. It was firstly reproduced photographically in uh, 1889, and that not in the Netherlands, but in Vienna. In the Vienna of Sigmund Freud, this painting was reproduced for the first in a photograph, and it was called the Garden of Earthly Delights, or in German, Der Garten der Lüste, what is a little more uh, with a sexual connotation. And uh, it, it was something, it, and I don't know if it is a coincidence that in the Freudian Vien Vienna, we, we find the painter at Neuronymous Bosch. And it dominated the way in which he was seen as a proto-surrealist painter. But was he really a proto-surrealist? And my attempt was to find out where the paintings had their place. Mythological, this was um, also a task of other authors. And some of them got different ideas of what this could have been. Of course, a triptych, they argued, is 
by its form something that belongs to a church. And this painting, this very special painting, could have been shown on an altar. So um, Frenger, uh, the German art historian, had as a consequence that he said, if this is an altarpiece, and it must be an altarpiece because it's a triptych, this can't be an altar for a Christian church, but it must be something different. And then he started to look for places where this could have been placed. And um, then we find Bosch back in a very, very sinister um, circle of people uh, have doing free love or uh, having sex with each other in front of that painting. And um, this was alien to me from the first moment onwards. And so I asked myself, as many other art historians did, what do we know about the provenance? What can we find out? And the earliest notion of that painting is in a description by a traveler who had seen it in the Nassau Palais in Brussels, in the palace of Henrik III of Nassau. And he describes the painting because as you said, it did not have any title. But his description is so, um, yeah, so clearly on this painting that we know the painting was in the Nassau Palais. And this was shortly after the death of Hieronymus Bosch. And it seems clear that it was done for that location. So um, he painted it for a palace. And then we find it back in a palace that was very special and was also seen by other tourists of the time as by Bosch's contemporary Albrecht Dürer. He did not see that painting. He didn't mention it, but he's seen other paintings and other rooms in the, in the house. Um, and many things he described were also described by these other travelers of his time. Um, there was also a bed, a party bed, if you want so, for 50 people, big enough for 50 drunken people. And in a palace where you have parties, where you need a bed for 50 drunken people, um, you can tr start to imagine the discussions that took place in front of this painting. And it may be very, very difficult to find out what Bosch thought or what his intention was, but we can try to reconstruct what the contemporary audience would have seen in such a painting. Can, can I just interject that uh, uh, Elizabeth McGrath has actually shown that one of the old references to this painting uh, doesn't, of, because as you point out, the title of the Garden of Earthly Delights by which it is known now is modern. But one of the, the very early uh, sort of references to it calls it the strawberries because you have these prominent strawberries right in the foreground, the, the uh, various figures uh, hugging or carrying strawberries. Um, not, not really strawberries. Um, it is, uh, it's another berry that grows in, uh, in, in Spain. And right. um, this was a Spanish priest that described that painting. And uh, he described the Madroño. It's right. called Madronio, and it's not really a strawberry. It looks like a strawberry, but it does not taste sweet, but bitter. And this is why he found this title uh, very fitting for that painting, because he interpreted the scene as something that on a first glance looks like something sweet or beautiful or positive. And then, in second instance, you see it leaves a bitter tone or a bitter smell and a bitter feeling. Yes. This, this is really an interesting painting um, because uh, we, we don't know how 
Bosch wanted it to be read. But what we yeah. can do is um, look at details, but also look at the all over composition. And then we yeah. can say more about that because he's showing a paradise on the left. And the paradise he's showing is a very special paradise. And what we can, we can say for sure is that um, people of that time believed in the fact that God created the world we live in. And the act of creation is described in the Bible. And what Bosch shows is something that is really close to the Bible. And um, the Bible and the interpretations of the Bible give possibilities to read this painting. We see a world where water and earth, plants and animals are present. And the first act was to decide between light and darkness. This was the moment when the evil came into the world and where the interpreters of the Bible placed the fall of the damned angels. And so this made it possible that the evil and the bad was um, also present in paradise. This made it possible that there was a snake um, that uh, gave the apple to Eve. And Bosch is showing that um, good and bad is present in this very paradise shortly after the creation of Eve. Because we see on the left of Adam, you see a cat with a mouse. She's kept the mouse. And you see many animals that are not positively connotated as alien dark animals that are not very paradisical or, um, yeah, they, they look evil. Yeah. Okay, but this moment he is showing, Bosch is showing the moment when sin came into the world. And it was before Adam and Eve took the fruit. It was the moment when Adam did not focus on God anymore, but looked to Eve. His gaze was not, uh, not more directed on God, but on Eve. And uh, this was the very moment when the problems began. Mm -hmm. And we have this lost paradise on the left, we have the hell on the right, and if you see other Bosch triptychs, you know that um, he has an idea of left is history, then the future is dark, that is hell. Yeah. The hay wane goes from the left to the right, and on the middle panel you see the hay wane brought up to hell. And if you know that, you can you can discuss if what you see on the middle panel of this here, if this is a positive present or a negative vision. And this is what this painting was made for. The courtly audience could discuss the relation of the sexes, could discuss uh, the good and the evil. And yeah, it's, it's open in a sense, but clean in the consequences. Hearing you talk about the painting, uh, uh, I was struck in your book uh, by the fact that, I mean, we live, we live as you well know, in a time where uh, um, historians are often sort of positioned as authors in their own right, uh, with whose, you could say, almost subjective opinions about uh, the works that I write, they write about uh, are almost equally important as the works themselves. But you choose a very different approach. You, you, you really, as Francois already indicated, you, you, you 
want to find the facts about what's Yes, yes, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, it's, it's my own way back to the sources. Yeah, we have another image here that can tell us a lot yes. about Hieronymus Bosch and what he did. This is one of the visual sources, isn't it? Yes, it is a visual source. And um, yeah, this leads back to the starting of my um, art historical education. In the end of the 80s, the American historical, historian Hayden White published a book uh, that came out in German under the title Auch Clio Dichtet. Um, and he says what historians do is very subjective and not very different from what uh, romanciers and poets do. Um, they are writing subjective opinions and bringing them to paper and telling that is a historical truth, but it isn't. And um, this was answered by uh, Reinhard Konzelek. And he said, yeah, historians are subjective, but we have sources. And sources never say what you can say about history, but sources do have a sort of veto right. And this veto right of sources means that sources say what you are not allowed to say. And so you can't say Bosch was a proto-surrealist taking drugs and living outside society, painting only his dreams. Because what we see here is the member book of um, um, a very, very, um, yeah, still existing brotherhood it is an illustrious, illustrious brotherhood of our blessed lady. And Bosch was a member in this illustrious brotherhood founded in the 14th century. And um, he did not have a coat of arms by himself, but most members had, because that was a very noble thing. And he was not only um, a member, but he belonged to the inner circle, as we know from many documents. And that means that he was a cleric and um, he was, must have been a pious man because he had also um, a crown sharing, uh, a tonsure like um, other clerics. And he visited mass often, um, the mass often together with other members of this brotherhood and uh, he did something for his own memoria because he was full of fear of um, what is beyond and after life and um, so he paid a lot of money for messing being read for him and what he also did was uh, painting uh, such shields this was found in the Saturn Bosch Cathedral and it lost his painted surface. But we know that Bosch painted on such metal shields the coat of arms of other members of the Brotherhood of Our Blessed Lady. Mm. And so his workshop was um, busy also with uh, other things and big triptychs or even yeah. artworks. Uh, in a way, this leads back to uh, the theme that has already come up as well, Bos, one of the many images of Bos that are floating around and are imprinted on the public, the, the public uh, uh, consciousness is that of sort of Bos as the eccentric, which, well, in a way, you could say is almost exemplified by the drawing that we see here, uh, which is closely related to the, the earlier triptych of the garden of earthly delights that we saw. Yes. Of, a, but, of many mo motives, and um, the, he is very, very inventive. He is someone yes. with a very good eye for nature. And for example, this is a very impressive landscape. If you look at drawings of his time, this mm. is a very naturalistic view on uh, the, the world surrounding men. And um, this is also something more because this is a very special kind of drawing. It's a finished drawing. 
This is not the, uh, the design for a painting. Other drawings of the time are mostly copies after paintings or things done in preparation of paintings. Yeah. But Bosch laid out his fantasies also in this kind of drawings that was an item for collectors. Mm. He's one of the first draughtsmen producing collector's items, finished drawings that have been collectibles. And he is very, very inventive. But um, what he invents um, has mostly to do with the world around him. Um, it, 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 it can be brought back to um, his religious thoughts, because if you are really, really um, a pious man, as Bosch is, then there is a certainty of faith. This is, uh, for, for, for us as modern people, this certainty of faith is, is nearly paradoxical. And, uh, something that is only in faith as hell or heaven are, can't be certain or for certain, but if you are a pious man, it is so. So um, what Bosch shows is um, are things that he could see in his surroundings as the owl sitting on the tree and the other birds around it um, attacking the owl. This was something used in the Netherlands to catch birds. The owl blind at the daytime is bound to a stick and is then attacked by other birds and you as a man can catch the birds. And this is something that can also be read as a symbol, something that can be seen, something that is in, in a way not realistic. You have a second old on the right that is attacked by birds. And it may be common it may be common knowledge for people of his time that mm. these birds are in real danger to be kept by some man being near there. Yeah, it's difficult to show because in, in my com on my computer, we have uh, the images of ourselves above it. So I move them and we can see that. Um, he does fantastic inventions, but all these inventions are possible in a way. Yeah. This makes yeah. him very special that um, he completes uh, God's creation in inventing animals that are thinkable. They are mostly complete and, and can be imagined as something that works. And yeah, also his monsters are mostly constructed in a way that you can imagine that they move. Yeah. But uh, th this image of uh, Boss as the eccentric painting is, is in a way very much a modern one associated with the modern notion of the artist as a, a member of a counterculture, etc. But as we see in the image that is on screen presently, uh, Boss was far from that in his own time. He was actually a very successful member of uh, the, the, uh, the, well, what you could say, the, the elite of the then boss society uh, and yeah. had, a, had a grand house on, on the boss, the, the, the central market square of then boss. Yes, a, a, a really a great house where he could have his, his studio, also with other people working there and uh, his uh, fellow citizens coming in and seeing what he is doing. And he was visited by the, the rich and the beautiful of his time in this house. And he was very rich because we know from the tax lists that he uh, belonged to the upper 10% from the beginning and ended up as belonging to the highest percent of income and taxpayers in Satungbos. He was really a rich man. And he was in the middle of his city and in the middle of uh, upper class and uh, well-being society. And so um, 
the, the image of Bosch as an eccentric. Um, he was a fantastic inventor, but what he invents was something that in the biblical, biblical sense of seeing our world was possible, thinkable, and believable. And, and appealed to all the rich people of the time as, as Francois. Yes, definitely, and... definitely. I mean, uh, a, a, another uh, image that Francois has also, in a way, alluded to is, is Boss as the, yeah, the highly idiosyncratic author, uh, the, the one who, even if he does a painting like the one we see at present, uh, uh, St. John the Theologian uh, or St. John the Evangelist on Patmos, uh, right, writing the uh, book of Revelation, uh, which other painters have done as well, uh, but usually in a, in a much more conventional way. When Boss does it, he immediately adds details like that, that curious little devil that we see uh, at the bottom right. Yes. It's not only the devil, it's also the landscape and it's, it's his painting technique. Um, yeah. That is very, very special and very interesting because uh, he is far away from these Van Archean or Robbie van der Weyden way of painting. He does it in a much more spontaneous way. He has the primed panel with chalk glue ground, doing his outlines uh, with, uh, with a pen and this very fast and abbreviated and then starting painting uh, and not uh, doing layer over layer and glazes over glazes, but in a very spontaneous way. And um, this use of color um, distincts him from others. His figure of uh, St. John himself is inspired by a uh, German prince of his time. Mm. You, know, you will you will find this St. John uh, figure um, in in the oeuvre of Martin Schongauer. Yeah. But this angel or this landscape with the perspective he gives with this high horizon and um, the horizon far away, um, this is completely different from what his contemporaries do, and it is very special. And he has his own style and. He puts his signature also on a part of an altar piece. Um, he, his signature he, here below on the right, under the devil. Mm -hmm. Also funny, the devil with his crow. This is something to um, use uh, in a slaughterhouse um, to, to pull the meat. Uh, um, and his, his name is directly under the devil with his crow and um, is written Hieronymus Bosch. This, this is a given name. His, his family name is uh, Van Aken, and his family called him Jun. His name is Jeroen, of in a Latinized form, Hieronymus. But Bosch is the name of his city. It's yes. an abbreviated name of his city, Hieronymus Bosch. And it's uh, in the documents of um, the Brotherhood of Our Lost Lady, where we find a document where it said um, that Bosch writes his name by himself as Hieronymus Bosch. And he does this in a formalized way, in the, even in the same way on all his sign paintings. Yes, but all, all that suggests indeed so, uh, this image of a, a, a highly individual author, as we would now say. Um, yeah, yeah, highly but, but individual. At the same, at the same time, uh, uh, what, what we wouldn't associate with uh, such an individual author is actually having a workshop where you have lots of assistants uh, yeah. contributing to paintings. And I think here we have one in which a, 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 an assistant has actually made a, a crucial contribution. Yes, yes, definitely. This is very interesting. And uh, the small book uh, has uh, not so much uh, illustrations as we would need. But the Hieronymus Bosch research project um, gives an x-ray of that painting. And you see mm -hmm. that uh, under the plant in the foreground, you can, no, no, 
Uh, this one, so. go back. Yes, uh, <laughs> under this under this uh, surrealistic plant, you find a donor on his knees. It's overpainted, and um, the overpainted donor makes it clear that this was not uh, part of an altarpiece, but was ordered as a special work of devotion by a man. Maybe he didn't pay. We don't know, but. In fact, this was overpainted, and our technological research uh, carried out by the Bosch Research Conservation Project showed that the overpainting was done very shortly after the painting was finished, and also the donor was finished, and was done definitely in Bosch's workshop. And that it is the workshop doing here um, is the application of the paint and also the motives themselves that point to a painter of whom uh, also the 16th and 17th century collectors know. Um, we don't know him by name, but uh, not for sure, but we, we know that he belongs to Bosch circle and uh, in, uh, was uh, able to paint like Bosch or nearly like Bosch, and repeated Bosch's compositions mm. and added things like this plant. So Bosch was someone having a workshop that is also visible in other sources. We had that coat of arms shield. And this shield was following a document not painted by Bosch himself, but by uh, his uh, um, staff members, um, his hands. Yeah, it said that it was uh, done by the hands of the master. That, that's again a sort of like in well industrial or functional activity that we might not associate today with uh, uh, the artist as as the individual author, basically. Uh, yeah. But in a way, it connects nicely to this next painting because in this one, you you, you have argued in the book that Boss is actually uh, in a way making a parody on a, on a code of arms. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I think that um, the scene in the middle is, uh, yeah, there's shown an operation shown uh, the cutting of the stone of madness. Um, that is here, not a stone really, it's a flower. And his mind bears flowers and a flower bearing mind um, maybe maybe a sort of illness, uh, and um, Bosch criticizes the Tam people and believing that madness is something that can be cured or folly is something that can be cured by such an operation of the brain. It, it, and, it's in a way also a, a parody of stupidity, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. It is. And... Um, the the monk and uh, the nun also shown there are not very helpful they are um, not full of compassion or so they ignore and the, the nun does not read the book she balances uh, on her head and what he has is yeah more interest in wine than in other people or in the word of god so they are um members of this stupid world that are the center scene of Bosch's oeuvre. Yeah, we basically. know that, that this painting was placed in Castel Durstede, and we know it's placed because of the inscription. It has an inscription, and the inscription says that uh, Master cut out the stone first. Uh, my name is Lubert Das. And um, this Lubert Das is an um, example of silliness or thumbness or, or, or he's a dumb person. And the text given here in an emblematic way with the painting um, is designed in a way that is really close to the shields with the coat of arms of the members of the Order of the Golden Fleece. Yeah. And 
Castel du Stede was a castle owned by a member of the Order of the Golden Fleece. So he would have known that, that this parody is directly addressed to him and the other members of his uh, royal... Of his class. Class, yes. Yes. Which, uh, in a way, is uh, uh, perhaps uh, we would think uh, uh, sort of an un underhanded challenge to <laughs> the social upper class. That that that's something that we, again we might more associate with a, with a modern artist. But um, yes, yes, uh, yes, and and yeah. But Bosch was in a way a modern artist because all we had uh, or uh, all I have said until now is uh, shows an artist that that seems to be a very medieval man um, stuck uh, stick to his faith uh, faith and his beliefs and um, is is. Yeah, a very uh, pious, and mm. but he was also modern in a way because he was uh, really, really deeply interested in artistic theory. Mm. I think, and uh, he followed um, the ideas of his time, what an artist should do, or how he should do that, uh, in the way that he his idea of how artworks should be read are in the way as rhetoric dictates yeah. that. Mm. If I may interject one yeah. little thing, one aspect that I find very striking in Bosch and in his exact contemporary, that is Leonardo, is that although they have a very different style, they're both very anti-clerical and you find a criticism of clergy in Leonardo and in the image that we just saw, you could see this also as a criticism of uh, monasticism, just antedating the explosion that happens at the time of Luther. Yeah, um, for Bosch, as a, a member of a religious order, it was clear that not all members of religious orders uh, are close to God. <laughs> this criticism of the church was part of the church um, and uh, it's an, a more or less internal critique. Um, and his idea of painting is the same as Albrecht Dürer has given it. Um, it was Albrecht Dürer saying, the art of painting is used in the service of the church and through it, it shows the suffering of Christ and other good examples, and it preserves the form of the human being after his death. So um, a, a religious function, um, meaning that you get good examples in art, and um, art has to give uh, help in saving the souls of people seeing that. And this you can do by uh, keeping the memory alive. Pro memoria, the portrait painting is pro memoria, to remember people, dead people, and the other is good, giving good examples. And giving good examples is what Bosch is doing here. Yes. Is, with, that, al is that also the case of the, the, with the painting that we're looking at now, the, the, the Temptation of St. Anthony? With, in, in a way, this is one of the works that uh boss is often uh, how do you say put forward as a sort of precursor of surrealism and this is the kind of painting that gives him that name but uh when you talk about him his paintings have a very different uh yeah if if meaning. you if you if you take serious what is said in in the legenda Aurea, and that he was uh Whoops, sorry, sorry. It's okay. It's, okay. Yep. it's interesting. Um, you, you find many details that can function in a rhetoric way. And um, there are many, many details on which you could talk. You have, by, for example, the motive with a big fish eating the little fish on the left wing. 
In the background, you see a big mm -hmm. fish eating a little fish or a small fish. Eat, the big fishes eating the small fishes is uh, something that is a proverb in Bosch's time and is also understand until today. You find it in caricaturas through the whole 20th century. And you have the central motive of the saint carried away and you have so many details that you can interpret and read. But if you see this painting, you in any way, you come back to the saint himself and to the story told and giving people things to discuss and paintings to read. And you can read that painting. You can, you can find pleasure in you will be emotionally affected by such a painting, but you also will learn something. Yes. And, um, to, uh, it's, this is a rhetorical principle, is to convince people. Yeah? And, and doing, uh, if you want to convince them, you have to, to, um, to please them, to affect them, and to educate them. And this is what Bosch is doing. And he has a rich, a very rich fantasy. And he has really, and you can find it in these paintings, also in his drawings, he loves these pictorial invention that are all founded in nature. Mm. His fishes are very naturalistic and he puts them to the sky. Um, and he has all these details as the bird um, on the left with his skates, and um, he brings a letter, a letter with what? Yes. To people under this bridge, what, what are they doing? Are they singing? And um, to, to, to think about all those details and to talk about that with others, makes this painting function in the way Bosch wanted it to function. Yeah. Bringing a courtly audience to a reflection of the own life and the long, long afterlife, the short life in this world and the long, long afterlife. So in a way, you would say that all these uh... Uh, like bizarre little details in Bosch's painting, they, they have an almost rhetorical function. But um, uh, yeah, it, it's part of an overall argumentation. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it helps to read these paintings. And, and this is uh, Bosch is constructing his painting that you have um, the possibility to, to, to read them. It is it's, uh, the Kantian idea of only having pleasure in one glance, or is, as Gotthold Ephraim Lessing puts it, that, that the difference between the text and an image is that you see the image on the first glance and uh, you have to follow the text successive. And uh, this successive reading of uh, texts is here done in a painting. You, you, you can't see it in, 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 in one short view. You have to follow the composition and you uh, then will find the, the holy figures or the devils or even what things that can teach you. But, but would you say, I, I think you say that in your book, that uh, this very sort of almost literate inventiveness that Bosch displays, uh, then got a sort of life of its own in the many imitators of his work uh, where, where the, the function yeah. becomes more or, or the, the, the accent shifts towards the comical yeah. towards this, uh, this towards is a good monsters. example in, yes. of that because um, this is uh, nearly something like a parody of, of what Bosch does mm -hmm. this is not by Bosch and um, most of the copies... Was it ever attributed to him? Yeah, it was attributed to him, but uh, wrongly, because this is showing... Oh, sorry. Monsters in a nearly ornamental way. Yeah, a Bosch monster function. 
Mm. And um, they, they can walk, they can work, they can do their thing. But here you have um, ornaments um, that are not necessary to make it function. And, and it, it does not uh, follow the construction method of nature. And the motifs are sorted like in a butter, butterfly box, you know, where you pinpoint one butterfly next to the other without, uh, yeah, <clears throat> with, with space around it. So um, you have one next to the other and they are ornamental as this motif in the middle, where you have something with uh, feet to below and feet up and no hat and no real arms. And this does not function. If I remember correctly uh, from your book, this difference between Boss and his imitators was already observed uh, in the 16th century. By, yes, by yes, 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 yes. Uh, the early collectors uh, knew the difference. Because uh, Bosch was imitated very often, and um, yeah, this is uh, also a nice example. Uh, it's one more of those uh, inventive drawings, and mm -hmm. there is something written down on inventiveness, and uh, its followers above on the <clears throat> on the drawing itself. But um, this is also a playing with. Uh, um, a saying and um, also an image that can be interpreted in many ways. And I think um, it is Bosch's idea of good artwork that it can interpret it, uh, can be interpreted in different ways. I think this, as you mentioned before, he, he was one of the first artists to actually make drawings that were for the market to be sold yes. as finished works rather than as aids for the for a yes, composition yes, of a yes. painting or copies after a painting. Yes, this is an illustration of a saying and this is yeah this is one of his classical religious paintings. And where you can see that his inventiveness also also functions in a very very traditional context. Mm. And um, the donor's figures are removed later and what you see is Christ shown to the people, the Eka Homo, and what you also see is um, this Turkish flag with a half moon, the red flag with a half moon in the background and here you have the donors again. Yeah. So, would you say that this particular image is also one that uh, maybe contributed to the the image of Boss as the medieval artist, which is something that yes. you are trying to contradict. And the drawing, yes. on the other hand, is very much something that positions him as a modern, uh, uh, a new artist that was doing really. New and he is also by his inventiveness and also with uh, with pointing to, um, yeah, he is also a modern artist in in his compositions. Mm -hmm. um, this is very close to um, Italian Renaissance art with reducing the scene on the heads of people doing pain to the savior. And his pictorial language is understandable for the people of his time. And what you hear is, uh, also can see is how thin he paints. Yes, you that's something can see new the, as well. The underdrawing with the with the BRI uh, in such a painting. Yes, that that's something very new as well. His style of painting, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. There, there is no real uh, antecedent for that, I think. No, but many, many, many imitators and followers of Bosch technique and style. What makes it very different and difficult to 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 um, decide where his reception starts and um, his own work ends, and it is um, the still unsurpassed work of Gerd Unverfehrt, who wrote a big book on the Bosch reception and his followers, showing also. Um, 
how searched after these paintings were and how often copied. Mm. Also, some of his um, main inventions as the Haywain. Yeah, and here we have the Vienna Last Judgment that is very interesting in, um, in many respects because you yeah. have, all, again, you have um, the act of creation, you have the light, God sitting in the light, and you have the fall of the rebel angels shown here, and they are falling directly. On the left wing, they are falling directly in the paradise. And then you see the creation of Eve. You see um, the expulsion from paradise. And mankind has lost paradise. And then uh, we have on the middle panel, the last judgment. Bosch, as many of his contemporaries was expecting. And his idea of salvation was very, very special. If you, yeah, it's wonderful. Bonsoir, thank you for, for zooming in because uh, if you go now to, to, the, to the left, um, you, can, you can see his very special hell, uh, for example. You can see um, Luxuria um, with a bed. And who um, does Luxuria has to go to bed with monsters. Or Gula, um, you have the man who drinks from out uh, a big barrel that is filled by a pissing monster in, 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 in prison there. And he has, to, he has to drink and drink. And, and, and if you now go down, uh, up, up in, in direction of the heaven, we can also find back Bosch's idea of salvation. There's only one soul directly over the bed. One soul with an angel, and he guides this soul out of this hell. And if you go up to the heavenly sphere, sphere up to heaven, you, here's another soul. And you have four souls brought up to light. And the heavenly paradise is only for very, 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 very few. Mm. And this scheme of uh, the last judgment with the... Um, paradise on the heraldic left, so on the right of Christ, and the hell on his left yes. is here interpreted in another way. We have the last yes. paradise, we have the past, we have the present, and we have the future. This, this, is, a, this is, as a last judgment, this is in fact highly unusual, isn't it? Because normally <laughs> you would have the, the second coming in the center uh, panel, which you do see here at the top, but then you would have souls going to paradise on, on our left and souls going down into hell on our right. Yes. But uh, Boss actually turns it again into a narrative that is to be read from left to right. Yes. But uh, uh, one thing that has been sort of suggested about Boss by some is that he, he might have been a member of uh, strange religious sects uh, that he had strange religious ideas, but uh, you would argue that actually his religious visions are all quite mainstream, aren't they? Um, absolutely, definitely mainstream in his time, or um, or yeah, even his in, time. The, in the in his brotherhood um, um, of the blessed lady. Um, this was what they thought, and um, this was what, how they wanted to teach people of. The silly world we're living in, and um, of yeah, all the sin that is in the world. Yes. So issues. Yeah, and and uh, he he answers with inventiveness, and these are typical Bosch monsters we, we have. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, in in. Uh, in the way how they work, yeah? Yeah. Find, you will find many of the details in his monsters back directly in nature. And there was a very interesting camp, uh, conference on the Vienna Last Judgment uh, three years ago, where um, also anthropologists and uh, people knowing more about uh, nature and creatures than I do 
talked about his uh, inventions of monsters and gave them a place in, um, in also in in the natural history. Uh, in a way that they say, okay, um, they do not exist, but they could exist. <laughs> they are constructed in a uh, in a in a way that actually would would function anatomically. Yes, yes, yes. At at the same time, these monsters are pro probably among the things that give both the 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 image of the artist of the sort of the unbridled imagination. But yes. uh, you, you also, you have shown that many times in the conversation today and in the book, you also position him very much as someone who uh, adheres to all, all sorts of allegorical conventions of his time. So his imagination is free on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, rooted in conventions that people from the time would have been able to read. Yes. Uh, this is a, a painting I really like. Uh, it, yes. These are the uh, outer wings of a triptych that was destroyed. And uh, yeah, and we have the same figure um, on the outer wings of uh, the Haywain. It is um, the poor man on his way through the world. And we, we come back from, we, we go through this world, we are all pilgrims and then uh, how is this world? And then we come to the inner side of um, the triptych. And this is a figure of identification. And then we come back to um, the history of salvation. One second. Oh. And we have the lost paradise on the left. We have the Haywain. And this Haywain um, rages directly to hell. And the hay um, is followed up by uh, all high-ranking people and also monks and nuns are keeping the hay. And the lovers not interested in the hay are also <clears throat> on their way to hell because they, they, have the, they can decide be, being... Um, lovers in the sense of Christ, the angel shows it, or in the way of hell. And most often they forget Christ. And this is also what the, what the tabletop with the seven deadly sins tells. It's the same story of a mankind that has forgotten God and God's sake. And the works of salvation. It, it's basically all, all, always from the, the loss of innocence in paradise, uh, uh, a broad road straight to hell. Yes. Always from left to right in the paint. Yes. And this is also courtly art. We know of uh, two versions are still in existence, others were lost. We only know, uh, know from uh, conversations, early modern conversations uh, about it. And uh, they were ordered also for um, the courts um, and were a part of courtly art. And it was a courtly audience then discussing richness or um, earthly wealth and uh, eternity in front of that. Yes, and probably looking at all these delightful little motifs. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. As yeah, but but um, giving also the urn of uh, garden of earthly delight a place in salvation is possible if you see the outer wings, and yes, yeah, yeah, and that that brings us kind of back to the beginning. But we yeah. we can also close that with uh, with this image. I I uh, would suppose yeah. because time is over. <laughs> Well, we have time for to close with the Garden of Delight. Yes, it's let's close with it. Yeah. So let's you, close the circle anyways. and come back to the Garden of Earthly Delight. Yes, uh, yeah, so. okay. Do so. <clears throat> so these are the outer wings of the Garden of yes, Earthly Delight. Yes, uh, and the 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 first uh, the third day of creation, and also on the third day, you can if you look at the plants, you can see that evil is in the world. 
because there are many plants that do not really exist and do not look very pleasant. And mm -hmm. uh, so we know um, evil is part of the creation and God has given us a decision to, the, to, to being good or follow his example and way or follow the evil. And yeah, having, having that in the closed triptych and then open it up in this castle with its bed for 50 drunken people, <laughs> you can you can you can imagine how they discussed it and and uh, that the title is, is is really not very good um the garden obviously delights but um, because there's no flesh in the uh, in the garden of earthly delight if you look at those figures in there they are they look really really flat and not naturalistic in a way and one could now think that Bosch was not able to paint naturalistic men. Um, but if you look for, for the iceberg on the left or for the other birds or other details, you can see that he was able to be naturalistic in a way. And on his um, Adoration of the Magi, also in Madrid, you can see a black king that is a portrait, one of the earliest portraits of a man from Africa we have in European painting. And then on the Garden of Earthly Delights, the black people are really black people, um, really to totally black and flat. And he, he gives, uh, um, through doing so, not to be too realistic, um, he makes it possible that the pornographic parts are only taking place in discussing the details. And if you if you put this in uh, Dutch language, many of the things they are doing um, uh, are very drastic. And are, are even, they, uh... even in saying in, in saying there are many birds, uh, um, yeah, it, it's it's also over birds. Um, it's it's all over vogelen. Uh, omdat Vogelen nog iets anders is. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, I believe Vogelen was a Dutch expression for copulation. If I'm yes, right. it was. It was. And, um, and this was uh, something that uh, I can imagine when looking at that painting that you can uh, have a discussion if this is the positive outcome of, um, of a world, if we would be still in paradise, would, would this outcome be our world or not? Or is this something that reflects our reality? We forgot what was said by God, what should we should do or even um, yeah, be fruitful and multiply. But uh, if one man presses flowers in uh, the back of another man, is this uh, in, in the sake of God? No, it isn't. Definitely not. This is uh, a detail that uh, reflects ideas of homosexuality that are in discourses also in the early modern period present in the, in the discourses, but um, not accepted by the church or by even the courtly audience for that this was painting. Well, I think, uh, thank you, and on this note, I think we should consider opening the, the discussion. The floor to questions. Absolutely. So uh, if you just want to use the uh, raise hand uh, um, system, and uh, I will, uh, I shall uh, unmute you. I think I might have to stop sharing my screen to, uh, to see everyone, but just a second. Yeah, you can find the raised hand function. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. At, at the bottom of the screen is a button called reactions. Under yeah. that, you, you, if you click on that, you'll find the raised hand. So you, if you raise your hand, then uh, we can unmute you and you can ask questions. Oh, well, uh, Claudia. Okay. 
Yes, I think you yes, were oh. you're muted. I can hear you. Oh, my video. <laughs> Sorry. I can see, I can see you. Oh, Sorry, yes. we, we've lost your video. <laughs> to Sorry? See you again. We haven't seen us for 30 years or so. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so it's nice to see you. My question is actually, this is something I, I just sort of uh, thought about while looking at all these uh, images. The, the triptych, uh, that he cho chooses the triptych for something which is clearly not made for churches, but has a sort of uh, an ecclesiastical function. Uh, is there any sort of, yeah, what is the discussion about that? Is, is that some sort no, of mocking it, it, of, of the triptych? Because these paintings probably haven't been sort of sitting on altars, but no, 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 no. you said in no. one case in a private palace. Um, they, they did not fit on an altar, and I think they were never presented on an altar, but hanging on a wall <clears throat> or installed in a wall, and um, together with portraits that also had shutters, or other paintings having shutters. Yeah, um, you have in court because collections of that time, you have portraits with having coat of arms on their shutters. And um, having this special theatricality uh, uh, that comes out if you present such a painting and open it up for discussion, um, you, can, you can make a lot out of that. Um, for a conversation, for a courtly conversation. And we don't have descriptions of people discussing in front of paintings from that time. But we know um, from diaries, from um, Antonio de Beatis' diary of, from 1517, um, that they discussed these paintings and have seen them in detail. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if, if we take that serious, we can say, yeah, they also had uh, cupboards with uh, artistic and artificial things that were opened up for the public. This is um, the, the, the earliest um, time where we find uh, collections that we can describe as Kunst and Wunderkammer. Mm -hmm. And this starts there. And um, the Brussels court had only also a zoo and um, if, if you want to show these animals, you also have to open it up, um, the stalls. And, and this um, is, I, I think it fits also for these uh, experiences and discussions in the courtly context. It's documented there. And it was something that we knew out of churches where normally the altarpieces weren't open for the public, only for high ranking viewers. And they had to pay for it. And it was uh, for travelers of the time, it was a sort of experience to go to a church. You can learn that from the Dura Sari, but he paid for um, um, seeing altarpieces that were opened up for him and he had to pay for it. And um, this experience transported to the courtly audience of the Brussels court um, makes it for me uh, understandable that this is triptych. And then this narrative, it's also a narrative form that you have these outer wings having the third day of creation then opening it up and having the creation of Eve uh, shortly be, before or, or the, the marriage of Adam and Eve, if you want so. And it's uh, on Saturday. And then what comes then? And um, then the discussion can start. And um, this is um, this theater, um, the theater effect, and these discussions are that are made possible by the triptych form. Um, it sure, might yeah. be a good explanation. So it's also well, playing a little bit on on that sort of tradition of the triptych. Yes. As an yes, yes. One thing to say is that we do find certainly in northern households. Uh, triptychs for private devotion, but these were usually small works. Uh, yeah. Boss's paintings are really very, quite large, and, and they, they were really painted as collector's items, I think, rather than uh, in, in the traditional sense mm. as, as religious works. Mm. 
Um, I see I have a question in the chat, so I'll write it from Ken Habib. It's two questions, two short questions. Could one say that Bosch's inclusion of black colored folk in an egalitarian setting with whites represents a very enlightened view for his time? It's the first time this gentleman notices it. And on another question, are all of Bosch's animal and grouping symbolic, or did he also paint such things just for fun? Uh, I, I think to, to start with the second one, um, it's uh, the one does not exclude the other. And uh, the symbolic meaning is also, uh, it's always made by the audience. Um, for me, it is absolutely clear he only was a painter. He didn't have a coat of arms. He was an, a no one uh, in, 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 in the society of his days. And if there was a discussion of a courtly audience and the painter was present, who's right? The honorary person of the court or the painter himself? Nobody is interested in what the painter thinks and he may be creative as he will. And he has fun in doing what he, do, uh, he does. Um, this is definitely clear for me. Um, Yes, his fun, and um, it was the audience giving symbolic meaning or so um, to the things shown. And in in regard to the black people, um, the black people are part of God's creation. And um, in Bosch's time, um, they followed the idea that uh, the early Christians uh, in Ethiopia. Um, were good black people, um, and and um, this uh, yeah, Bosch fantasy is, um, is, is is reproducing an act of creation that is also absolutely fantastic in all his diversity, and Bosch is interested in diversity, and God creates diversity. And this diversity is readable in different ways, because we have the problem that God created a very diverse world and did not give names to the things. He gave uh, the possibility to speak to Adam, but it was Adam giving the things the names and the language of Adam is so poor. Mm -hmm. That if you want to understand what God's creation is, you have to interpret it in different ways. And you can interpret in at least four ways, mm -hmm. in a historical sense, allegorical, and so forth. But this can be interpreted in so many ways. 